Stocks down for the week, but riding high for the year, with the NASDAQ up close to 30% this year so far. Joining me now, U.S. Equity and Quantitative Strategy at Bank of America Securities, Savita Subramanian. Savita, so great to see you again. Great to be here. So there's been a lot of discussion about how a very few tech stocks have been behind most of the market's gain, but not as much about what the implications are for valuation. So you've been pointing out that the difference between the cheapest and the most expensive stocks is unusually high right now. What do investors do about that? Well, yeah, so it's an interesting environment where we've been in this very narrow market. And I think it's been frustrating for investors that haven't been in those you know, seven stocks that have delivered the strongest gains. Uh, what's very interesting right now is that if you look within sectors, if you look across the broader market, the cheap stuff is very, very cheap and the expensive stuff is very, very expensive. So what we found in the past is when you reach these levels of dispersion across valuation, it's actually been a great signal that value investing is likely to generate some of the strongest returns. And we've seen this a few times in the past. We saw it coming out of the tech bubble. We saw it coming out of the financial crisis. But the idea is there's just, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of returns to be made by just going long, you know, the most uh, inexpensive but still high quality companies and selling the expensive, potentially overblown valuation stories. The trick is figuring out which cheap stocks aren't traps and, and are, are likely to recover rather than continue to get cheaper. So we have our ideas, and I would love to share them with you. Uh, please do. Uh, no, you, so you're saying don't just <laughs> buy the index. Don't, don't buy the cheapest stocks in the Russell. Exactly. So I think that there's something really go interesting going on right now where the index itself, the S&P 500, is trading at a relatively lofty multiple on price to earnings. It's trading about 20 times on earnings. But if you take out the big, the biggest stocks, if you just stripped out the nifty 50 or the biggest 50 stocks, the rest of the index is trading at a relatively low 15 times earnings. So our view is there's just a few stocks that are really driving the valuations up. And right now is a much better time to look for older cyclical companies that could actually benefit from a lot of these tech themes that we're hearing about. And you know I have to say it, but I think AI is you know, obviously a big, a big driver of tech. I think that AI is more about old economy companies becoming more efficient than it is just about technology companies. So there, I, I feel really bullish right now on the idea that we're finally in for productivity gains in the market, which is something we haven't seen for a very long time. You know, that's another interesting chart you've published recently is showing how bad we've been on productivity since, well, I don't know, 05 or so. Um, what does that mean for inflation? If we, can, if we can bust out of this, is that a positive? You pointed out that even wage inflation can be good for the overall economy. Well, yeah, so it's interesting because I think that you basically st saw a stall in productivity and efficiency in 2010 and that was basically when zero interest rate policy started. So companies had really easy ways to make money. They didn't have to worry about getting efficient because labor was relatively inexpensive. You know, they could just do buybacks, levered buybacks, and that was just an easy way to manufacture kind of financially engineered returns, lots of cost cutting, zero cost of financing. So it was like easy money to be had for corporates. Um, but what we found is that when companies are actually focused on productivity, the multiple that investors are willing to pay for those stocks is better, is higher. So, you know, investors don't like to see easy cost cutting driven earnings growth. They like to see efficiency driven permanent, you know, improvements in the business model. Um, so for the economy overall, our view is that this is the, the next argument for why margins could remain uh, relatively healthy. And that's one thing we were worried about, you know, coming into this hyperinflationary period was the idea that companies had geared themselves to very low costs and low interest rates. How are they going to navigate an environment of higher costs? And what they've done, they've, they've been doing all the right things. So I think what we're seeing from corporate America shows that companies are adapting to higher costs. 
You saw this with tech companies. They, you know, they did a round of layoffs or two. Um, they're removing a lot of that cost structure and really focusing on how to get efficiency with the labor that they have. And I think that's that's potentially the big positive going forward. Uh, we've got to run, so maybe just a, a one number answer. Uh, do you think we will get to two percent inflation by the end of 2023, 24, as a result of these forces? No, I think there's structural reasons for why inflation remains higher. I would say three or four is, an, uh, is a likelier outcome. All right, Savita, thank you very much for coming on the show. We appreciate it.